It's time for the Creative Real Estate Podcast, your source for out-of-the-box real estate investing strategies brought to you by realbluespruce.com. Creative listeners, how are you doing? Welcome to the Creative Real Estate Podcast. I'm Adam Adams. This is possibly the longest running every other day real estate <laughs> podcast. We only talk about the out-of-the-box strategies that move your business forward. We don't get any of that non-creative stuff. With us today, Joe Fairless. How are you doing today, Joe? Adam, I recognize that introduction from somewhere. I just can't place it, though. It seems eerily familiar. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I botched it a little bit, but a little bit about Joe. He's the host of the <laughs> longest-running daily real estate podcast, three-time author and host of the Best Ever Conference, which you can go for the biggest discount, hashtag Blue Spruce. So go to besteverconference.com and get your tickets with hashtag Blue Spruce. That gives you the biggest discount code available. And if you recognize his name, it's because you're a loyal creative real estate listener and you heard him on episode 19. Back in episode 19, Joe Fairless had a $230 million portfolio. It sounds like a lot, but right now you have $400 million? Yeah, a little, uh, over 400, but close enough. Yep. Excellent. Well, tell us a little bit for anybody who doesn't know you, tell us a little bit about your background and we'll get into the episode. Sure. Well, uh, looking forward to our conversation. It's always a fun and um, uh, uh, enlightening conversation when, when, we, when we talk. And uh, a little bit about me, from Texas, moved to New York City after I graduated. My, I made 30000 bucks as a junior project manager and then uh, climbed the corporate ladder relatively quickly, became the youngest VP of a New York City advertising agency, was investing in single family homes along the way once I had some money, kept my living expenses relatively low for New York City standards. My friends would make fun of me because I was living like a college kid, even though I was 10 years graduated from college. But, uh, you know, I, I was saving up money when um, perhaps they weren't. And uh, so I started investing in real estate on the, on, on the side and then ultimately became um, apathetic towards my full-time job and wanted more. At first, I was trying to achieve a monetary goal. I wanted to make $100,000 in salary by my 30th birthday. I accomplished that around my 28th birthday. And I was like, okay, uh, it wasn't quite what I thought I would, it wasn't, I'm not feeling quite what I thought I would feel when I accomplished this goal. And so I realized I needed something more. So I uh, attempted to get that by going to a, an agency that did more philanthropic work, worked with nonprofits. And um, it was a little bit better, but ultimately I decided I need to leave the industry and um, do some other things. And so I sampled life experiences. Uh, that's what I call it, where I was testing certain things while I had my full-time job. For example, I was interviewing people for a book. I was doing stand-up comedy. I failed at that miserably. I, I, the, the, I, I performed in two places. One of them has since shut down. So that's how good or bad I was. They went out of business afterwards. And I did some other things too. Um, I taught a class on how to buy single family homes while living in New York City, but investing in where, where the numbers make more sense. And ultimately, I landed on apartment investing. And um, so now, as you mentioned, uh, we've, we've got over $400 million, my business partner and I, along with our accredited investors. And all of our portfolio is in Texas We'll be expanding from from Texas, but you know, right now we got a, a good thing going, and um, just a focus really on the execution of those deals. All right, so today we're going to talk about your book, your real estate conference, and I want to get into your best advice ever because I don't think that you always have that opportunity to really dive deep into that one thing that you recommend to others. And then we'll talk about a challenge that you had in your business. But before so, you kind of introduced our, yourself saying Texas, New York, corporate v, earliest, youngest VP, you did single family. My first question, how did you keep your expenses low? When you were in New York, what were you doing to actually keep your expenses so low? I lived in an apartment that was, uh, when I first moved in, in, oh, what was this, 2006, um, well, first, my first apartment was 700 and some dollars, and so was my check every other week from, um, or twice, twice a month 
from my advertising career. So I lived in a very dangerous area of, of Brooklyn at the time. I'm not sure where it is now, but it was East Flatbush, Brooklyn, and um, very dangerous. Statistically speaking, the busiest police precinct in all the five boroughs at the time. Um, so I, one, I lived in a, an area that wasn't desirable for a year, but then for the remaining nine years I was in New York, the way I kept my expenses low was I had a roommate in my apartment um, had two bedrooms, one hallway, one bathroom, and a tiny kitchen area. That's it. No living room, no, 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 no extra room um, or anything like that. It had a dorm style refrigerator that was stained red from some chemical concoction that one of my previous roommates had created. He was a chemistry major. He was going to college at the time. And I don't know what he blew up in there, but it stained the bottom of the refrigerator and melted a little bit of stuff too. Um, and I, I had those expenses um, low relative to my um, friends who were moving into one bedroom apartments or even studio apartments as they were getting promoted. Whereas I was just you know, having a new Craigslist roommate every year or two, and it kept things interesting. Um, have some crazy stories from roommates, but perhaps not not the right forum for for that. Um, but that was the main way because you know when you live in New York City, eh, I guess most places in the U.S., your your um, rent or your mortgage is going to be your number one expense, and and same with this. So instead of paying. Um, let's see, my, my apartment was, it started at 1700, um, divided by two. Um, and then it went all the way up to like 2100 divided by two. Cause I always had a roommate. So I was paying at most like a hundred, a thousand fifty bucks mm -hmm. a month, which other parts of the world in the U S that might seem like a lot, but in New York, it wasn't. And I was able to save the rest. And, oh, and I was in, I was, um, um, so this isn't a, from an expense standpoint from on the weekends, I was earning extra income by babysitting. I actually, I worked at a daycare in college. I don't know how many people know this, but I worked at a daycare in college. Uh, I was called Mr. Joe by a bunch of three and three to five year olds worked, worked with a hundred preschoolers. And then after I graduated college, cause I was making $30,000 a year in at the, at the full-time job. I would take on babysitting gigs on the weekends. And so I would, you know, babysit kids and make, um, make some extra cash on the side. Very, very interesting. And it's like an apartment complex. You are cutting all of your expenses and you're finding new sources of revenue. Yeah. So way to bring why. it back. Yeah, um, there we go. There we go. Okay. So, so first off, let's chat about this a little bit. So we're already having a couple people in the office read through this 400 and, Let's let's look. Four hundred and twenty-three pages. Mm -hmm. That's insane. So it took you to, a year to write this book. Uh, why'd you write it? It fills a void uh, in the industry. I mean, that the, if you've got customers before you have a product, then you've got a damn good business model and and something that's worthwhile to share. And uh, I certainly had heard about others and myself included at the time when I was getting started who needed a step-by-step -step playbook for how to do apartment syndication that uh, wasn't talking about the, the what, but um, was focused on the how. And that's the key with this book. It focuses on the how to do an apartment syndication, uh, breaks up into four categories. One is getting the experience two is the deal, three is the money, and four is executing on it. And, um, you know, I, I, I am an apartment syndicator. So why not um, write about how to syndicate apartments and um, help others along the way? So let me ask you, um, you said it talks about getting the experience. What's, what are the takeaways from that part of the book? Oh, well, I mean, ultimately, I, at least it, it, most people have a challenge of wanting to do larger deals, but not having done a larger deal yet. It's chicken before the egg dilemma. And the solution there is you surround yourself with the right people. And that's not groundbreaking. I mean, that's, that's not revolutionary. Most of the people who are listening have heard that. 
but there are some tactical things that you can do in order to surround yourself with the right people. On my very first deal, and I talk about this in the book, um, I brought in the brokers who are representing the seller and they put their commission into the deal and they got 25% ownership in the deal. And then I could talk to my investors and I could say, um, correct, I do not have the experience yet on a large apartment community. However, the brokers who are representing the seller believe in this deal so much, they have agreed to invest their commissions back into the deal and invest alongside with us on it. And that's pretty powerful. So ultimately what you're trying to do, and that's just one example, there are many things you can do um, to bring on experienced team members, but the, 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 the way you do that is you show alignment of interest with your investors and those experienced team members. Um, there, you know, there's another tactical thing you can do where you um, partner up with the property manager company, you give them a piece of equity uh, in exchange for them um, bringing their experience into the deal so that you can then, again, go back to your investors and say, hey, here's how we have a line of interest with people who have decades of experience um, so that you proactively address the question of, well, you haven't done this before. Uh, and you know, before you go into doing an apartment syndication, I mentioned this in the book, you need to have baseline knowledge of what the heck's going on. So I don't recommend um, you know, going from wholesaling one single family home to doing an apartment syndication because the learning curve is too steep. Um, however, when you are at the point where, okay, I have the baseline knowledge, now I'm ready to do it, but oh, there's this challenge that most people, 99% of people have come across, by the way, of I don't have the experience, but I want to do a larger deal, then I list some ways to have alignment of interest. And I, I don't know how many I list, probably 10, 15 um, uh, ways to do that so that you can then partner with the right people and ultimately overcome that challenge. Great. And I've, I host a lot of meetups and I, I see a lot of people that come to me and they, they're missing that key component. So I like that you put it first in the book because it is something where um, other, other people, they just really get hung up on it. So it's almost, in my opinion, putting that first is, is a way to say, don't let this be an excuse anymore. So um, I've already had a couple of people read this book and they're a lot faster at reading than me. So it took them a few days. I don't know how they could do that, but it took them a few days. They couldn't put it down. I literally, well, first off, I, I read a review on Amazon a couple days ago and they mentioned that you referred the book to them. Oh, so, uh, nice. Great, yeah, grateful for that uh, first. Second is um, when we were in the final stages of the review process, I literally read the book cover to cover to do a final pass to catch anything um, in 36 hours. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was, yeah, it's the most I've ever read in, in one sit, in one sitting ish. Uh, and, and then third, going back to the experience thing, if someone listening is getting caught up on the experience thing well first we've just provided some solutions and then there are more solutions in the book but perhaps shift the mindset from i don't have the experience how can i get the experience to how can i mitigate the risk on a deal i do as much as possible because ultimately the investors are asking about your lack of experience because they don't want to lose money i mean that's what all roads lead back to capital preservation so um, if you ask yourself instead of how I don't have the experience, um, what do I do? Instead ask, how do I get mitigate the risk on the deal that I do as much as possible, knowing that if I do well or when I do well on my first deal and my next deal, then there will be a domino effect and a snowball effect where I will get momentum that continues to move and move and move and build and build and build. Uh, and when you ask yourself, how can I mitigate the risk as much as possible on the deal, then it just becomes like a natural solution to bring on the right team members and to bring on the expert team members. So it's not a matter of should you do it on your first couple deals. It's a matter of you must do it on your first couple deals because you want to mitigate the risk. Great. As far as doing the deal or finding the deal, do, in the book, do you go over underwriting strategies, rules of thumb, things like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we go over how we underwrite value add deals and the assumptions to um, look at a little bit closer than others. 
as well as how to find off-market deals in a challenging market. Right now, it's pretty challenging to find a deal. The money is um, available, relatively speaking, um, but the deals are not as available. And you know, there's always a challenge at any point in time. So who cares? It's uh, there's always solutions. You just got to implement the solutions and 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 work harder or be perhaps a little savvier or clever than than others. And one way that we talk about in the book that I've personally done um, finding an off market or finding deals in a tough market is we found the apartment community, all one bedrooms. It was marketed by a broker bidding process, bid the property way up. Uh, it was at the ceiling of where we would pay. So then we looked across the street, found an owner who was not marketing his property. We approached the owner via a broker who had a relationship with the owner. We knew the broker. Um, that broker helped us get the property across the street, which by the way, happened to be two and three bedroom apartments. And we were then able to go back to the original property, the one that was getting bid up and up and pay top dollar for that one because we were buying it as a portfolio with the off market property that was across the street that complemented the one bedroom property really well because it had twos and threes. And then in total for the portfolio, we got below market. We were buying it below market because we were buying it um, two properties in one. So the takeaway is in, an, in a hot market, one tactic, and I talk about this and plus a bunch of others in the book, is look across the street or look next door. If you have a property that you like, but it's on, it's on the market or perhaps you're direct to the seller um, or the owner and they're looking for too high of a price, then take a look across the street or next door, see if you can get a combo deal. And if that can bring your total transaction costs down, then you might have yourself an opportunity. Wonderful. Uh, between, so the third one is money. My question to you though, is between finding a deal and finding money and, and answer completely honestly, what really is harder, finding the deal or finding the money? The deal. But there it depends go. on where you're at in your life cycle of a syndic as a syndicator. Because uh, at first, both. <laughs> For, uh, you know, when we started out, it was both finding a deal because you got to get the credibility with the brokers and the owners and also finding the money because you got to get the credibility with the, with the, um, with the private investors. Um, but you know, now, I mean, you're asking me what am I, what, what's the biggest challenge now? Absolutely, the deal. Okay, wonderful. On raising equity for closing on the deals, uh, I do have a question. So I was, I was going to try to have you at the Raising Money Summit by the time this comes out, totally passed already. Um, but I wanted to put you on stage and I was going to ask, what do you do, Joe, to raise, the, raise equity? Something that is tactical that men, hopefully out of box, that the listener can take away from. I focus on, and I would have loved to come to your event as you know um but my wife just went off and got pregnant and <laughs> by the by the by the time this airs um we will have had our our uh, baby girl um knock on wood so uh that that uh, that is probably the only reason the only thing that could hold me back from attending 10 in your conference is a baby girl um first kid so uh in terms of what i do to um raise equity and some, maybe something that's um, a, a good takeaway for listeners is I'm strategic about the communities I'm a part of and I go deep within those communities. I read the book um, Small Giants by Bo Burlingham or uh, Bo, Bo something, Bo Burling something. And uh, he talks about, and Small Giants is a book about a small company, so like five people to 500 people. So, you know, depends on how you define small, but that's how he was defining small. And these companies could be doing 500 million to uh, you know, $3 million or three to $500 million worth of revenue. Um, so they're, they're small, relatively speaking, to larger companies, but they're still well-established and doing well. Um, so he, he, he learned how they got to that point and how they thrived. And one thing he identified is that they were entrenched within the communities that they chose to be in, entrenched in. Um, so, for example, um, what I do with um, my communities is I've identified the communities that I'm all in on. Uh, one is Junior Achievement. I'm the board member for Junior Achievement. 
two is Texas Tech University. I'm on the alumni advisory board for Texas Tech. And in fact, uh, this will make you feel better about your conference. I um, was awarded um, outstanding alumni at Texas Tech. And it's been an award that, you know, it, it's, it's tough to get. And I did not attend those ceremonies uh, this past Saturday because uh, I, I was not traveling. Um, and in addition, Texas Tech, bigger pockets. So junior achievement, Texas Tech, and bigger pockets. So what does that mean I'm focused on those communities? Well, it means that I um, make it a point to be very available and involved within each of those communities. So how does that, how, what does that look like tactically speaking? Well, tactically speaking, before, we'll go with bigger pockets. Before I um, had the ability to plunk down a decent chunk of money on advertising on bigger pockets, I was just very involved uh, within bigger pockets. I mean, I was posting 10 times a day, literally every single day. Um, there's some badge you get. I think it's called like the crazy psycho stalker badge or something when you post that frequently on bigger pockets. But I got that badge on bigger pockets and I've posted a whole bunch. I don't post nearly as, uh, no, I don't post really at all um, compared to what I was doing before. But now I've evolved my approach so it's more scalable with my time. And um, I'm doing advertising on bigger pockets, which has not started yet, but by the time this airs, it will have, it will have started. Um, with Texas Tech, uh, an example is I am on the Alumni Advisory Board um, and I attend the meeting every year, except for this year. But in addition to that, I look for opportunities to be more involved. So I've had a scholarship for uh, Texas Tech students for the last seven, eight years where I fly one or one to two students from Lubbock to New York City, and I set them up with advertising agencies that they can shadow or p professionals they can shadow over a weekend. And um, I've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, in addition, something that happened recently, I, I learned that Texas Tech was having a, a basketball game and they were donating all the proceeds from the sales to shoot victims of a, a school shooting near Houston, Texas. So I then bought $1,000 worth of tickets for um, people who uh, were um, not able to pay for those tickets locally in Lubbock, Texas, but who could then attend. And then all those ticket proceeds are going donated to, you know, victims of a school shooting. You know, I mean, why not? And so that's the type of stuff I consciously look for within each of these communities, because I know um, the more value I add within each of the communities, you know, the, the, the more, um, uh, grad or, or, or the, the more good karma I'll build up as a result of it. And it does make, it does increase business results. Um, there are direct L, uh, return on investments for, um, you know, spending time every year in Lubbock or you know, doing advertising or being involved on bigger pockets. And the important thing you've got to look at is the lifetime value of a customer. What is your lifetime value of a customer for an investor, for you know, someone else involved in a deal? And whatever that is, if you, if you invest half of that um, or a fourth of it or, or you know, 10% of that into acquiring the customer, I mean, you've got yourself a pretty good business model. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, I think that's one of those things. You know Jason and Peely pretty well. Peely yep. often will Very say, you need, to re you need to rewind that last five minutes and play it again. That's, that's definitely one of those times. A lot of, a lot of good insight. Thank you. On the insight, on the execution of an apartment building, it doesn't just stop when you close, does it? A lot of people talk about how to find apartments, how to get the money, how to you know, get the, well, that's really it. How to find apartments, how to get the money. That's what most people talk about. They don't talk about the execution of it and the money's made or lost when you execute on these large deals um, more so than how you buy because for the most part, if you get to the finish line, you've, you likely have a, an idea of how to underwrite deals because you've done it so many times. That's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the, the problem with this dynamic is it takes a lot of deals to underwrite in order to find a deal. Therefore, you've just muscle memory. You've done it many times, so you would naturally get better and better at it. But congratulations, you just closed on a deal. Oh, this is the first deal that you've closed on. And there are no trial runs 
for this. This is your deal. So make it happen, execute. And that's where a lot of the money is lost is on the execution uh, or gain is on the execution. And so we went into the details of, and when I say we, Theo uh, and I went into details of the execution and, and ways to, there it is, uh, ways to think about and, and actually implement some best in practice um, asset management techniques. Yeah. And yeah, kudos to Theo um, as well. I'm going to get him on the podcast. He's done some incredible things uh, working with you, aligning himself with the right people, everything that he's doing in his business. So uh, yeah, that's why we've pushed that out in front of everybody who is watching because this is both on the um, the podcast that people just listen to. But if you guys want, you can pop over to YouTube and look at this and you'll be able to see what we're doing and how we're talking. So there is a couple other things that I wanted to talk about. Um, first is your conference. So if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, what, why you started the conference is, and is, is the brilliance of having a conference somewhere within your book as well to help people get to the next level. Because I know that's a step that, that works for you. Yeah, I, I talk about having a thought leadership platform and the conference certainly is one of them. I, I discuss having a meetup group, a local meetup group, which you, know, you do in spades and the benefits of that and the benefits of, of hosting one versus just attending one. Because if you have the time and you dedicate your time to attending one, then you'll get um, a disproportionate uh, greater results when you host uh, relative to just attending one. Um, so uh, the, the conference, the, re the reason why we did it is because there's a need for a conference that has um, a focus on commercial real estate. This, we, we don't talk about, I don't think, yeah, we don't talk about single family home uh, investing. It's all commercial real estate focused. And the investors in the room are investors who have experience. Uh, so this conference, while it would be beneficial to someone who has not done a deal, you might be in over your head if you're brand new to real estate and attending the conference. I think you'll soak up a lot, which is great, but the, the investors who have done a couple deals and are looking to continue to scale, uh, and in particular um, within commercial real estate, and I'm talking about anything from multifamily to investing in marinas to raw land, um, office retail, anything within commercial, uh, this is this is the place to be in Denver. I completely agree. And I believe that we are looking at February 22nd and 23rd, right? You got it. Best is, that a, is that a Friday, Saturday? What, what, what are the two yeah. days that it's on? Yeah, Friday, Saturday. Okay, perfect. And you've quoted me and I appreciate it being on your commercial, but I watched the commercial for it and there was a lot of different people that kept saying this truly is the best conference ever. And I remember saying that when they got me on there, but uh, what, what I said in there is this conference is amazing. I was blown away. That was while I was at that conference the first time, I was just totally blown away and uh, kudos to you and your whole team to Ben. And um, what I've taken from that conference, it, that the networking alone, uh, I don't remember how much the ticket costs, uh, but <laughs> the networking alone is at least worth 10 tickets, at least worth 10 tickets. So uh, very, very good conference. And again, for the audience, if you want to come, just put in hashtag Blue Spruce and it'll give you like 25% off. Uh, go to besteverconference.com. And then let's look, what was I going to ask you? All right. What's the your best real estate investing advice ever? Uh, I'd say control the money and the deals will come when you have access to whatever amount of money that you need, then deals tend to be sent your way. And you know, the, the more financially successful I become, the more and more I I've witnessed that firsthand. Uh, whereas at the beginning, you know, weren't getting as many deals, uh, but as we uh, gain 
you know, a bigger and bigger footprint, we get sent deals frequently. And then I personally get sent a bunch of deals and a bunch of wacky stuff too. So it, it does uh, necessitate having a, a stronger filter. But um, when you focus on the money, then deals will come. Now, that's uh, important to, uh, it's important to elaborate on that a little bit. One is a lot of people in you know, single family and you know, smaller residential say, hey, find the deal and the money, uh, the money will come. Well, not so much with commercial because if you find the deal and don't have the money, it's, it, you're going to have a lot of gray hair after the deal is over if you complete the transaction because it's going to be quite challenging so you want to have the, the money lined up first. And when I say lined up, you're not, no one's funding anything into an account, but you're speaking to investors, telling them about what you're doing, and you're saying you're learning about their goals. And once you learn about their goals and you talk about what, you, what you're doing, you say, if I find something that can meet your goal of X, Y, Z, would you like me to share it with you? And they're all going to say, yes, yeah, I'd like you to share it with me. And, you know, when, once you do that, then, then you uh, acquire enough of those commitments and you know what that dollar, sound, a dollar amount associated to those commitments is by simply asking, okay, roughly, what are you looking to invest if we find something? And now you know the type of deals you can go after and the, the size of deals you can go after. Um, so that would be a very tactical thing that I suggest that those who are continuing to go larger and larger focus on. Let's, let's take it here. What is a challenge that you've had in your own real estate business and how did you overcome it? Well, my, I, I was smooth sailing. So I first started buying homes and I was smooth sailing house number one, house number two, house number three. They all cash flowed at least a hundred bucks a month. They all were less than a thousand dollars to be move-in ready. And they all had $10,000 in equity, equity at them at closing, which were my three things I wanted. But then my fourth house, it was uh, bought it from wholesaler, bought it for thirty-five thousand dollars. Thought it would cost five thousand to be move-in ready, was not. Ended up being fifteen thousand after I got into it. Hired the wrong contractors. Um, actually, it was a family friend, and that that was a, a hot mess. It was I was living New, I was living in New York City at the time. The property was in Fort Worth, Texas, where I was from originally. But um, I wasn't visiting the property because I had a full-time job at the time. And after all said and done, I spent $15,000 more on renovations. Uh, the rent for the house was the same, might have been lower than what it was prior to the renovations. And the house was not worth, um, yeah, it, it wasn't worth the increase. It didn't increase the value $15,000. So I, I learned a couple of things. One is have a business plan and know what that plan um, takes in order to execute. So I was doing unintentionally or, or subconsciously, I was doing a value add business plan, but I didn't consciously think, oh, I, I got to add value, increase the, increase the rent. I'm going to do X, Y, Z. I didn't look at comps. I didn't um, find the right contract or find the right team. I didn't oversee the project. And I didn't run the numbers um, well enough. And uh, as a result, I, I, I probably lost like $5,000. I was lucky that the market just kept going up. So I was able to get, um, get most of my money back out of it. But at the end of the day, I lost $5,000. But the lesson I learned was probably a multi-million dollar lesson because I then applied that to my apartment buildings. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're in for the final five. What is the most creative deal you've ever done? Oh, probably the, the first one that I mentioned earlier where I, I uh, brought in the brokers for 25% where they put in their commission. I think it was $317,500 commission that they earned and they became owners um, in the deal and it was a mass release and um, you know, we, we were able to get in the deal uh, for out of pocket eight hundred and forty three thousand um, dollars to control a six and a half million dollar property. That's awesome. I like that. All right, and then the, there is a lot more info on that on episode nineteen. So if you're a listener and you want to really dive deep into that, there's more info on episode nineteen. Joe, what's a book you recommend? 
depends on what you're into, but one of my favorite authors is Robert Greene. And um, so any, any book that uh, Robert Greene has written, um, so 48 Laws of Power would be one of them. Great. Where were you five years? Take us back, paint us the picture, what it looked like for you five years ago. Oh, five years ago. Well, I do a daily journal, but I've been doing it for three years. Otherwise, I just pull up the daily journal and read whatever I was doing five years ago. Um, five years ago, let's see. I was just moving to Cincinnati. and I, No, I wasn't just. I was in New York City, and I was I, – actually, I was closed on my first apartment community, um, ish. We'll say five-ish years ago. Okay. Um, and what did, what was it like when you were trying to raise equity for that 800,000, 43, 843, I think you said? Yeah, 843. Community uh, five years ago. Painful, emotional roller coaster. Um, the reason why is because I had investors who had committed and then backed out last minute. And that left me in a tight spot. Uh, so I ended up getting an appraisal for the property even though I did not have to since we're getting it via master lease, but I got the appraisal so that I could then use that to share with my investors in hopes of getting a renewed interest from uh, any current investors uh, or investors who had said, no, thank you at first. Got the appraisal. It appraised for around $300,000, $400,000 more than what we're buying it for. And um, so, you know, after that, I shared it with my investors. They saw the equity we got going into it and it worked out. Was your podcast running five years ago? No, uh, I think we're on around, uh, by the time this interview airs, probably around 1,700 episodes. So 1,700 days ago, whatever that math is. Okay, okay. All right, so where did you see yourself? I mean, now is five years from then. Did you see yourself doing what you're doing? No, I actually have a, a note. It's behind me. So behind me is like my inspiration wall. And I have notes from investors and flyers from our properties and stuff like that. And one of the things I have printed is an email that I wrote to my family, uh, November 12th, 2012, I believe. Um, it was definitely 2012. I don't remember the exact date. Um, and I said, I came, I conquered, but I don't want to do advertising anymore at all. I don't know if I conquered, by the way, I just said it. And I want to focus on helping others with their career as well as um, pursuing real estate. And so it wasn't, there wasn't a clear vision at first uh, in terms of doing apartment syndication, but I realized as a result of teaching the class uh, on, a, on investing in single family homes, people who, who attended the class, they said, well, if you do something larger, let me know. I'd like to partner with you. And going back to what I said earlier, if you have customers before you have a product, then you've got something pretty good. And so I realized my customers, investors, wanted to um, partner up, but I did not have a product, a apartment community. So then the light bulb went off. Okay. So, all right. And where will you be five years from today? What do you see? Uh, executing on deals. You know, that's the main focus is as, as long as we continue to execute well on our current portfolio, then we'll grow organically and things will sort themselves out. Awesome. Awesome. How many, how many doors? So you've got $4 million. Where do you see yourself five years from today? Uh, 400 yeah, million. 400, yeah. A couple zeros. <laughs> uh, where do I see myself? What? In five years from today, do you have a portfolio size that you expect? No, I don't care. I, no, okay. I, don't, I don't care at all. I mean, I say a billion dollars before my 40th birthday. I'm 36 right now, but I, I really don't care about that. It's, it's kind of just, a, um, just something to, to throw up there. Um, our focus is performing. As long as we perform, we'll continue to grow organically. Investors will continue to invest with us. I mean, I have an investor who's invested with us 11 times. He's in 11 of our deals. And, you know, we'll, we'll just, we'll keep rolling and, you know, whatever, wherever we grow to, we'll, we'll grow to. And we already kind of talked about how you give back. How do people find you? How do they find your podcast, the best real estate investing advice ever show, or how do they just get to know you a little bit more? Yep. Uh, if you're, well, just go to joefairless.com. You can, you know, if you're wanting to passively invest, go to investwithjoe.com. If you're wanting to actively do apartment syndications, then go on Amazon 
read the reviews from the book, uh, best ever apartment syndication book. And after you read the reviews, when you buy it, email the receipt to info at joefairless.com and we'll get you a bunch of goodies. Um, just mention that you heard about the, you know, the gift um, on the show. Awesome. Thank you for coming on, Joe. I really appreciate your time. Hey, enjoyed it. Hey, listener, go get this book. It is incredible. Joe spent a year on it for a reason. Uh, Joe, I really appreciate your time. And until next time, my friend, think outside the box.